Ian Parbury here, and uh, I want to give you an introduction to the arcane mysteries of the black art of program debugging. Now, why have I called it arcane mysteries and a black art? Well, we teach lots of classes about programming. We don't tend to teach very many classes about debugging, whereas, in fact, a programmer will spend uh, an awful lot of their time in the process of debugging. So here we go. After the introduction, which we're doing now, I'll tell you a little bit about debugging tools, uh, quite a bit more about debugging with printfs, and uh, finish up with some other debugging methods. Here we go. A taxonomy of bugs. There are two main kind of bugs. One is your program crashes, and the other is your program doesn't crash, but does the wrong thing. Notice that failing to compile is not a bug, so don't come to me with uh, your uh, programming assignments that don't compile. You won't be getting any credit for them. Failing to compile is a failure, not a bug. So anyway, program crashes or works, but not quite the way you want it to. A quick historical note here. The term bug is usually attributed to Admiral Grace Murray Hopper in 1947. Now that's a picture of her at uh, top right. She lived to a, a grand old age. When uh, colleagues traced a fault in the computer they were using, the Harvard Mark II computer, they traced the fault to a moth stuck in, apparently, really number 70 in panel F. Uh, she remarked at the time that they had succeeded in debugging the system. Now, the remains of the moth can still be seen in their logbook. Here's a copy of their logbook. They carefully logged everything that went on. And as you see, there is the moth taped to the middle of the page. Yeah, this is relay number 70, panel F, moth in relay, first actual case of bug being found. Alright, so don't be ashamed of having bugs. Now, Theodore Rubin said in another context, the problem is not that there are problems, the problem is expecting otherwise and thinking that having problems is a problem. Now, if we replace the word problem there, by bug. The problem is not that there are bugs, the problem is expecting otherwise and thinking that having bugs is a problem. So yes, you will write code that has bugs in it. There's no need to be ashamed of it. There's no need to try to hide it. Everybody writes buggy code. Of course you want to keep those bugs to a minimum and to fix them when they turn up, but of course um, they will be there. Over on the right, you see a couple of bugs. I, I took this picture at my uh, father's house in Australia. That uh, centipede there is, you know, I don't know, four or five inches long, and that's a horrendously big cricket that it's dining on. So yeah, bugs can be big and hairy. Steve McConnell in the book Code Complete estimated that uh, an average programmer generates 15 to 50 bugs per thousand lines of code. Now, remember, each of those bugs could hold you up a long time when you're trying to get rid of them. Uh, notice there's a big difference in programmers. Programmers that make 15 bugs per thousand lines of code are probably much more in demand than those that generate 50 bugs per thousand lines of code. So uh, we want to get that number as small as possible, and, uh, but, but we'll never totally make it the zero bugs per thousand lines of code, I think. All right, so some debugging tools. These debugging tools, of course, don't include a big hammer, which is probably what most people use. There are things called debuggers, specialized debugging tools for programmers. For example, there's the GNU debugger, GDB, available for free on Unix. Now, debuggers let you interrupt the computation. They call it a uh, put at a breakpoint and uh, examine the contents of memory at that time. So you can look around, see if things are the way you want them to be. Now, 
they're very good for catching low-level bugs, but quite often the big picture is hidden by too much information, which is also known as, of course, can't see the wood for the trees. If you're just looking at um, uh, binary or integer values from memory, uh, these may represent some structure, and uh, it's hard to get the big picture of what that structure looks like from uh, binary data, unless you're, of course, very, very, very experienced. Nonetheless, they are debuggers are very useful tools. So using the GNU debugger, you'll need to compile with the minus G switch, and that makes the compiler generate extra information for the debugger to use. For example, uh, if we use the command G++ minus G, prog1.cpp will compile prog1.cpp and produce a dot out. To run the debugger then, at the uh, Unix prompt, you type gdb a dot out, and the debugger fires up for you. Now, GDB has an interactive shell. It's uh, text-driven, of course. It can recall history with the arrow keys, autocomplete words, you know, kind of, uh, some of the time, I guess, with the tab key, and has other nice features. If you're ever confused about a command, or you just want to be reminded, use the help command, with or without an argument. So, if we use GDB in parentheses as the prompt from the GDB shell, uh, we type help and then command, for example, help help if you want to, and it'll tell you all about that command. Alright, so to run your program from within GDB, when you've got the GDB prompt, type run. If your program has no serious problems, i.e. no bugs, then it should run fine here too. That is, the debugger shouldn't introduce bugs. That would be a problem if it did, of course. If your program does have issues, if it has bugs, then you should get some useful information like the line number where it crashed and parameters to the function that caused the error. And there's an example there, program received six seg v segmentation fault. Oh, that, that really helps a lot. And a bunch of numbers. Now, breakpoints can be used to stop the program, as I've said before, uh, at a designated point in the code. The simplest way is the command break which sets a breakpoint at a specified file line pair. So for example, if you want to set a breakpoint in file1.cpp at line 6 of the code, you write break file1.cpp colon 6, like we have right... Uh, hang on, let me get the pointer uh, right here, file.cpp 6. Now if the program ever reaches that location, the debugger pauses at that point and prompts you for another command. Of course, if it never reaches that location, it won't stop, will it? So once you've set a breakpoint, try using the run command again. This time it should stop where you tell it to, unless it dies before then. You can proceed on to the next breakpoint. Oh yeah, you can make multiple breakpoints. I forgot to mention that. It's pretty obvious. You would need more than one. Um, proceed on to the next breakpoint by typing continue. You can single step, that is, execute just the next line of code by typing step. That gives you fine-grained control over uh, program flow. Of course, if you've got a lot of code, that can take a long time to step through all the code. So now you've learned to interrupt program flow at a specified point, and uh, you can step. But sooner or later, uh, you're going to want to, at that point, query memory. I don't want to see things like the values of variables. The print command prints the value of a variable, print slash x, prints it in hexadecimal. So saying print myvar, if you've got a variable called myvar in your code, it will print it out for you. Um, now breakpoints interrupt the program at a point in code. Watch points interrupt whenever a watched variable is modified. So uh, if I say, for instance, down here, watch myvar, the next time, uh, that is assuming there's myvar in your code, the next time myvar is modified, the program interrupts and prints out the old and new values. Now, uh, a little gotcha here. Uh, you may have multiple variables named myvar in your code. Remember, uh, they have different scopes. 
so which my var is used, well, it's the one that's currently in scope when you type the watch command. Some other useful uh, GDB commands here. Backtrace produces a stack trace of uh, a function, of the function call, sorry, that lead to a segmentation fault. Where is the same as backtrace. Uh, you can use that uh, any place. So backtrace after a seg fault where at any time. Finish runs until the current function is finished. Uh, ignoring the uh, breakpoints. Delete. Delete a specific Breakpoint info breakpoint tells you about them if you've forgotten what you've been doing and for more information of course look at the manual there's a man entry or uh, use the help that should be enough to get you started now Visual Studio for instance uh, Visual Studio is uh, an example of an IDE an integrated development environment um, in Visual Studio, you compile in debug mode, which is equivalent to the minus G flag in G++. You set the breakpoints by right-clicking on a line in the code, which shows up in the, uh, the editor in the IDE, and selecting breakpoint from the menu. Then when you run your program in debug mode, the IDE stops your code at the breakpoint and displays local variables for you. And some other use. Here, for example, is... Um, uh, Visual Studio stopped at a breakpoint. Um, as usual in Visual Studio, you see here is uh, the editor open to a line of code. There's a, a, a bunch of windows down here. You can select them by tabs. And a bunch of windows here selected by tabs. Here we've got the output. Here we've got local variables displayed because we've been running um, in debug mode. We do that by selecting debug up, up here. Um, and... Uh, I've set a breakpoint right here in the code, so we've broken this line, um, and we see displayed for us the local variables here, because I've selected the locals tab, and I can uh, look at the value of these local variables in uh, hexadecimal, for instance. Um, so the values of the variables are over here. Um, other things we could query include, for example, the call stack here to, to see uh, if we're hip deep in function calls. Now, there's also specialized debugging hardware available, in particular for closed platforms such as game consoles. They have special uh, development kits with a custom debug version of the hardware. So these are a pair of uh, debuggers in use here for a game console. Nonetheless, even though you have all these tools to help you, the most important debugging tool, ah, good coffee, the primary debugging tool, the one that you keep in shape by drinking coffee, is your brain. These tools are useless if you don't think. I know it's hard, but you're going to have to learn to do it sometime. All right, so debugging with printf. Uh, uh, at the same time, the most primitive way of debugging and uh, the most tunable way of debugging. You use printf to print out the contents of variables, and you get the opportunity thereby to format, to select the ones you want to format them exactly the way you want them. You get to print, say, a list as a list instead of a bunch of binary or hexadecimal numbers. All right, so let's see uh, how you would debug a crashed program. So what do you do when your program crashes? Well, a lot of people panic. Um, yeah, don't panic. Experiment with your program and think. Try to get some idea about where in the code the crash occurs, if you can. The first task, though, is to reproduce the bug. Make it happen reliably. Find a series of actions that's guaranteed to make the bug occur every time. Ah, a, a caveat here. If that's possible, there may be some bugs that occur probabilistically, that, that they only happen some of the time. You can't make it reliably happen every time, but in that case, try to find a series of actions that's guaranteed to make the bug occur with high probability. Now, uh, 
Once you've done that, you should have some clue then as to where the bug might be in the code. Okay, well, uh, if you know what actions make it happen, you can uh, identify the pieces of the code that get exercised by that action. That's probably where the bug is. Now, reproducing bugs can be very difficult. Some bugs are not easily reproducible. Now, in your professional life, once you become a professional programmer, you may have a quality assurance team, abbreviated QA, tasked with finding bugs. They're trained to do that. They have automated tools, and uh, they, in general, they do a good job. But they may not tell you how to reproduce the bug. They may just tell you, oh, we found it. Here's what it looks like. Um, knowing how to reproduce the bug may tell you enough about it to figure out what's causing it. So you definitely want to know how to reproduce it. First of all, so you can uh, test if you fixed it. But uh, it tells you where to proceed. So QA may tell you about the bug. How, figuring out how to reproduce it may be in your hands. All right, so we're thinking about a, a program that crashes here. So start by adding some printfs that output messages on function entry and exit. Do this for the suspicious functions, or all of them, if you have to, although that may take or should take a long time because, of course, you've broken your code up into a lot of small functions. Look at the output file. Oh, yeah, printf. Uh, I guess I should say f printf printf to a file. Look at the output file after your program crashes. If you see an entering function foo message, so somewhere you've got a printf entering function foo message, and, and if you don't see an exiting function foo, then you know the crash occurred in function foo. And of course, this won't be a 10 page function, this will be a short function because you know to make short functions, right? That gives you a, a big clue. It happened in there. When you found the function then in which the crash occurs, you need to add code to localize on which line it happens. So uh, put in a bunch of printfs until you find the line on which it happens. Now, um, yeah, remember to use binary search. You might want to put a printf in the middle of the function, and if it's a if the bug happens before that, if the crash happens before that, you would want to put one a quarter of the way through the code, etc. Binary search. So you find which line the crash occurs. So when you found the line of code that, that's bad, then add code that prints out the values used on that line right before you get to it. And you look at those values. You think hard. Are they right? Are they what you're expecting? Is it the, uh, are the values what uh, your code is expecting to get? If not, what should they be? And how did they get to be bad? Oh, key point here. Although the crash happened here, the thing that went wrong, the thing that needs to be corrected, may be someplace else. So think about that. Uh, do I put extra code in right where the bug happened to ignore a bad value? Or do I go back to where the bad value was created and make it right? Well, it, it, that depends on context. So some more quotes. According to Murray Gelman, a famous physicist, the Feynman problem-solving algorithm, and Dick Feynman, another famous physicist, his problem-solving algorithm was this, write down the problem, think real hard, write down the solution. Mm, that's really useful for us. It may have been great for a genius like... Um, Feynman, but not for... Oh, we can take some things away from it, though. The write-down-the-problem thing, yeah. Um, I'm not saying exactly write it down with pencil and paper, but make sure you've figured out exactly what the program is. Think real hard. Yeah. As I said before, look at those debug values. Think why they are different, how they're different, how did they get to be different. And uh, once you figured it out, write it down. Albert Einstein, oh yeah, I should say think real hard. The previous slide I said think real hard too. Um, yeah, so Albert Einstein said, it's not that I'm so smart, it's just that I stay with problems longer. Yeah, right, he's not so smart. Of course he's a lot smarter than all of us. 
but the last part of that sentence, that I stay with problems longer. You've got to keep with it until you figure it out. Because Voltaire said, no problem can stand the assault of sustained thinking. All right, Norman Vincent Peale said something more useful. When a problem comes along, study it until you are completely knowledgeable. Then find that weak spot, break the problem apart, and the rest will be easy. Yes, in general, you find with bugs, once you find that weak spot, once you figure out what the problem is, break it into its pieces, it generally is easy to fix. It's finding it and figuring it out that uh, is so time-consuming. All right, so debug output, we can send it to a, a debugger, but what if your program crashes the debugger? It's been known to happen. You have a bug so hairy, it crashes the debugger. Sometimes you may even crash the operating system. Output to a file is good, so use those F printfs, but that's not real time, is it? It can be annoying to have to reopen it every time after you run your program. Uh, output to a remote debugger on another computer is good. You get output in real time, but it's ephemeral. It goes away. It's not saved in a file. If the uh, remote debugger crashes, it's gone. There are uses for all three, and you'll want to use all three at some point in your professional coding life. So a couple of warnings, though. There are some bugs, the really big hairy ones, that can't be caught with debug printfs. In particular, bugs in timing and scheduling of multi-threaded uh, processes. Adding debug output will often slow down your program. You'll notice that in Visual Studio, if you compile in debug mode and compile in release mode, the release mode program generally runs much faster than the debug mode. There's all kinds of stuff in there, uh, and, and that minus G switch gets, gets you all kinds of stuff in that debug compiled program that slows it down and thereby changes its execution profile. It runs differently, in other words, and that may make the bug go away. So try using as few debug outputs as possible so you don't slow things down. Yeah, if you debug output into a file, that file I.O. will slow things down and change how your program behaves. Now, of course, if you find, and it often happens in uh, Visual Studio, that you have a, a program that crashes in release mode and works great in debug mode, if that happens, then, well, that's a big clue. Stop and think. What could it be that works fine in debug mode and doesn't work in release mode? All right, so let's finish up with some other debugging methods. Of course, the best debugging method is don't put in bugs in the first place. Now, I'm reminded of uh, the old television show Hee Haw back in the 19, uh, I guess it was 70s. Um, there was one sketch in that show where uh, a hick would go to the doctor and say, Doctor, doctor, it hurts when I do this. And he keeps raising his elbow. Doctor, doctor, it hurts when I do this. And the doctor slaps him on the elbow and says, Well, don't do that. Well, yeah. You got problems with bugs? Well, don't do that. Don't put them in. This is called defensive programming. Uh, it's a set of uh, habits that um, minimize the number of bugs in your code and uh, perhaps even more importantly localizes the damage when you do have bugs. Um, so in defensive programming you want to test for preconditions even when you know they're going to be true because you made it. So if you've written for example um, an integer multiplication function that insists that the uh, input to be positive doesn't work with negative, so you're assuming that outside that function you do the jiggling with the negative sign, right? Multiply two negative numbers and it becomes positive, that kind of thing. Um, so even though you're sure you aren't going to get positive numbers, maybe you'll forget at 2 o'clock in the morning when you're coding. So uh, even though you know it's only going to get positive numbers, put a test in there, um, just to be sure. Of course, write your code in small chunks, as we've seen before. And now debug each chunk before moving on to the next one. That's a cool idea. Do a little bit, debug it, move on. Don't write all your code and then see if it works. Keep all those old versions. Now, in your professional life, you'll use a revision control system, or RCS. Go Google it if you don't know what that is, to keep track of all your previous versions. So you can roll back to a version that you've uh, uh, 
had before. Let me talk about diff. Here's a picture of a diff. Uh, no, that's a differential. Here's a picture of diff. Um, oh, it's a picture of WinDiff, the Windows version of diff. Diff on Unix doesn't have this nice IDE here. Diff on Unix gives you a bunch of text. Um, you give it two files and it tells you where those two files differ. Here in this version we've got uh, two versions of a piece of code that I've written. Um, one version we've got a line in red here, in the other version it's in yellow. So clearly I've added some parameters here. Right, and uh, I've changed here a variable name. Okay, so I could diff two pieces of code. So if I've got an old piece of code that isn't buggy, and the new piece of code that has the bug, I can do a diff and find out exactly what's different. That's the place to look for bugs. What have I changed since the last version? So diff makes all the difference. As I said, it's a Unix utility that compares two text files, tells you when, where they differ. Um, a um, small act of desperation, I, I guess you could describe it as selectively comment out your new code until the bug goes away. I would say use diff, uh, find out what's changed, and think about those, and figure out, oh yeah, that, that may be where it happens. But if you can't do that, comment out lines of code until the bug goes away. That'll identify it. Could take a long time, but if you do it right, it's guaranteed to work. Probably not a good um, a good way of spending your employer's uh, dollars on your salary, though. It's also what I call the uh, facepalm method. And a big shout out here to uh, Ian Bogost at uh, Georgia Tech. The facepalm method is a, a method of social debugging. What you do is you grab a friend, set them down in front of the uh, code, walk through your code line by line with that person, explaining it as you go along. Here I do this, here I do that. Nine times out of ten, you will spot the bug yourself and be horribly embarrassed by it. So okay, here in this line I do that. Oh my god, this is wrong. How did I ever do that? I'm terribly embarrassed. Never underestimate the power of embarrassment then as a debugging tool. Of course, this works best with somebody you'd prefer to impress. Or it even works with people who don't understand code, of course, because you're going to do the spotting yourself. So that's the facepalm method. Embarrassment is a big tool. The universe wants to embarrass you. Uh, I should also mention distractions. Now, during the long and ardu arduous debugging process, yeah, this will probably take a long time. Mm, good coffee. You'll be tempted to stop for coffee, like I just did, and procrastinate. Go on Facebook, play a game of Angry Birds, do other things, talk to your friends. Your manager, if you're employed, will probably think that you aren't making any actual progress on finding the bug. You may even get fired. But the unconscious part of your brain is always on the job, even when you're chatting on Facebook. Keeping the conscious part of your brain distracted can actually help the unconscious part work on the problem. So don't be afraid to be a little distracted. Now it's elementary. Remember your primary tool is logic. Emulate Sherlock Holmes. Gather, gather together the evidence and use logic. Remember what Sherlock Holmes said when you have eliminated the impossible. Whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Now, you are truly a professional programmer when your bugs take three days to find and 30 seconds to fix. You should not have bugs that require you to, line, to, to, require you to write pages and pages of code to fix up. Now, boundary conditions. Um, Douglas Adams in Mostly Harmless wrote, We all like to congregate at boundary conditions where land meets water, where earth meets air, where bodies meet mind, where space meets time. We like to be on one side and look at the other. So the types of boundary condition in code. Now bugs like to collect around boundary conditions. So that's where you should start looking first. These include the first time around a loop, the last time around a loop, the code immediately following a loop, the code 
at the start of a function, the code after a function returns, etc. Boundary conditions. In particular, pre and post conditions. Pre conditions are the ones that um, should hold before a piece of code. Post conditions are the ones that hold after you've executed that piece of code. So for each unit of code, for each block of code, for each function, for each loop, ask yourself, are the preconditions met? That is, are the conditions required for its correct execution? Um, do they hold at the time of execution? Do they always hold? Have you made sure that they hold? Um, does it meet the post conditions? You've executed this piece of code for, to achieve some aim. Does the code you've written meet those conditions, uh, both the explicit and implicit ones, for correct execution of uh, later code? Now, suppose all that has failed. Um, maybe it's four o'clock in the morning and you're just too tired and you just can't see it. It's due, in, due the next morning, um, or due, due the same morning at uh, 9 a.m. You just don't know what to do. How am I going to get this done? I've got three hours left. What am I going to do? Well, uh, one method of last resort is the trace. Now, you do need to be awake to a certain extent, but it's just uh, a mechanical process. You are less likely to mess up at four o'clock in the morning. Grab yourself a pencil and a piece of paper and pretend to be a computer executing your program, or more ideally, the piece of the program where you're sure the bug is. So maybe by this time you've located where it might be, but you're not quite sure what's wrong. Okay, now this can be used for crashes and for wrong code, code that works but does the wrong thing. So it's a method of desperation because it's so time consuming and tedious. Let me show you what it's like on a simple function to compute Fibonacci numbers. Fibonacci is one of these um, old white mathematicians. This is picture at bottom right. So Fibonacci numbers are defined like this. The first two Fibonacci numbers are 0 and 1. From then on, the next Fibonacci number is the sum of the previous two. So, over here, um, hang on a second, here's my laser pointer. Um, first Fibonacci number is 0, the second is 1. The next one is the sum of these two, 0 plus 1 is 1. The next one is the sum of these two, 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 plus 5 is 8, 5 plus 8 is 13, and so on. We number them starting at 0. So um, this is the 0th Fibonacci number, the 1st, the 2nd, the 3rd, the 4th, the 5th, the 6th, the 7th, and so on. So, um, for example, 3 is the 4th Fibonacci number. And let's try to compute the 4th Fibonacci number. Hopefully we get output 3. Now, Fibonacci numbers are uh, typically um, used, as, used as an example in elementary coding classes. Uh, Fibonacci numbers are found in nature a lot. Go Google, and you'll find cute things like um, uh, the spiral in a seashell is uh, created using Fibonacci numbers. Okay, here's a simple function to compute Fibonacci numbers written in uh, C, C++ actually. Hmm. So here we go. A function returns an integer. It's called fib. Takes an integer n as a parameter. It's supposed to return the nth Fibonacci number. Oh, I don't have much room for code here, and you can see uh, this is not defensive coding. What happens if if uh, n is smaller than zero? I'd want to uh, return some uh, value like maybe negative one or zero. I'd want to maybe throw an exception or something. Here I'm doing nothing, so not good code here, but I didn't have much room on the slide. All right, so we want to return the nth Fibonacci number. Here we go. Oh, yeah, there is some defensive code here. If n is less than or equal to 0, return 0. That should be if n is equal to 0, return 0. The 0th Fibonacci number is 0. But I've put less than or equal so that it, if I accidentally call this with n being negative, I get 0 returned. OK, cool. Return 0. Otherwise, um, OK. Um, yeah, here we go. Int a equals 0, b equals 1, c. So I've not initialized c. 
4 int i equals 2, i less than or equal to n, i plus plus, and, um, okay, c gets a plus b, a gets b, b gets c, go around this for loop, when we exit, return b. Oh, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, that obviously works. <sighs> well, it's not so obvious. I've not commented it well, I've not named my variables useful things. These are all defensive things that you should do. Give variables useful names, like not like A, B, and C. Um, so maybe I've messed up here. Maybe this um, B equals C should go before the A equals B. Um, maybe that B should be... C. I, I don't know. Have I got it right or I messed up? Let's do a trace and see. So to do a trace, you start off with a copy of the code over here on the left. Um, yeah, you can print out a copy of that code. I'm against printing. Real programmers don't print code because it wastes paper. Uh, we should just keep it on the screen. But this is one case where you might want to print because then you can draw on it with a pencil. Right, so grab a piece of paper for every variable here. Uh, write a box. So these are easy integer variables, little boxes for the parameter n, for the variables inside here, a, b, and c, and for the loop variable i, and I'm going to put the return value down here when I get it. Alright, so start out the first line of code. Let's call fib of 4. Try to figure out what the fourth Fibonacci number is. Remember, our answer should be 3. Ah, good coffee. Alright, down to the first line of code. If n is less than or equal to 0, return 0. Well, n is 4, so nope, that doesn't happen. We go down to the else. Alright, int a equals 0. Uh, sorry, screwed that up. Let's go back. int a equals 0, so 0, b equals 1, 1, c, we don't know what it is yet, and we go on to the next line of code. Alright, for loop, 4, int i equals 2, and then we have uh, i equals 2, we've got 2 sliding in over here, i less than or equal to n, i plus plus, so we go around this loop until i is bigger than n, right now 2 is smaller than 4, so we go into the loop, at the end of the loop we'll want it increment i. So here we go, herring in the loop. So, we've arrived in the loop, we do this line of code here. c becomes a plus b, and then a becomes b, b becomes c. Alright, so c becomes a plus b, a plus b, 0 plus 1, c has gotten the value 1. So next a becomes b, so this a should become 1. Let's see. Yep, A becomes 1. And then B becomes C. Well, um, B and C are the same, so nothing happens. Same result. And we go around the loop again. So back up here. Um, we hit the loop. We have to increment I. So down here, this 2 should become a 3. Here we go, 3. Um, i less than or equal to n, 3 is smaller than 4, so we stay in the loop. Then we head down to this line of code here. c gets a plus b, a gets b, b gets c. Alright, so c gets a plus b. c will get 1 plus 1 is 2. Um, a gets b, b gets c. Alright, let's do that. Um, yeah, B gets 2. The others stay the same. Oh, cool. Then, we head back up to the for loop. We increment I. I get 4. Um, 4 is less than or equal to 4, so we stay in, go back down to the line of code. C gets A plus B. So uh, C gets 2 plus 1 is 3, then 
this B will be copied over to A, and that thing we put in C will get copied over to B. Here we go. C gets A plus B. Right, C gets 3. A gets B, so the 2 gets copied from B over to A. Um, and then B gets C, so the 3 gets copied up to B. Cool. Back up to the for loop again. I gets incremented. So I is now 5. And um, 5 is bigger than 4, so we break out of the loop. Go to the next line of code, which is return B. We return 3, and yes, the fourth Fibonacci number is 3. This has worked. Now, of course, you'll be doing this with a pencil and paper and, a, and an eraser and scribbling things out and moving stuff around with arrows and things. Yeah, do it yourself by hand. That will be guaranteed to, um, uh, to execute the code as it is written. Very important point. When you're reading through your code, you're quite often not reading what's written there, but reading what was in your mind when you wrote it, which is something completely different. That's why the social debugging, showing people, and the actual tracing through code like this actually works. It gets you to read what's really there. There are more debugging methods, of course, that I haven't talked about. Um, exceptions uh, are useful because they get you out of, um, when you hip deep in function calls and recursion maybe, they get you out of there to make a, a decent error report. Assertions make sure that um, your preconditions are true. Uh, logging is another good technique. Uh, logging is basically writing to a file anytime your program does something which does slow the program down, but at least you know everything that's going on. It's also the post-mortem debugging. That's when you take that uh, core dump file and uh, examine it to figure out what's going on. You don't need a computer. You just need to uh, have a certain amount of patience to go rooting through all the binary data to find out what went wrong. But remember, don't panic. Think logically. Gather your data reason about what went wrong. Thank you for your attention. Bye-bye now.